Six days ago, we started our two-week canoe trip to explore and experience the wilds of Wawakimi. We were now 90 kilometers in and already got a bit of everything, but we were behind schedule and needed to continue pushing on. Here's the next part of our journey. From day seven on, my filming became more sparse and sporadic. In fact, I didn't film once during day seven, so my apologies for relaying this day's events through stills. This was early in my filming days, and I still wasn't fully committed to this method of capturing my adventures. The first half of the day would take us through a series of unnamed lakes and bodies of water, which would entail several portages in between. We started the day with two small portages. It took a bit of time locating, but the trails were clearly overgrown and underused. Then we paddled north along a long, narrow lake to the next portage. It was a cooler day with sporadic rain, so we made sure to cover up. The second half of the day involved paddling through Pickett Lake and continuing along the river to another portage. It was then a short paddle to finish the day at the mouth of White Clay Lake. I should have mentioned, we crossed the height of land the previous day and were not only paddling a different river, but was also paddling downstream. It was another long day, but we made decent distance and knew from here on out, the route would generally be easier. We really needed day eight. After a late start, we paddled across most of White Clay Lake under a beautiful weather and decided to make camp early in a nice cove. It was a chance to wash up, dry things, and simply relax, something we all needed. Including the dogs. Daddy. Daddy. Hey, buddy. After a swim and cleaning up, it was time for supper. There was lots of wood and great rocks to make a small cooking fire. Chili was on the menu tonight, while relaxing and eating on a nice beach site. The day started with blue skies and no clouds, but they moved in later on that evening. Even though we got a bit of rain, it delivered another spectacular sunset and lit our cozy campsite in a golden hue. Day 9 was another portageless day as we paddled across the wide expanse of White Clay Lake and started into the Golki River system. But day nine was remembered more for something else, wildlife. Dave and Dee were fishing the narrows along the way and caught a walleye. But soon after, Dee snagged into a monster pike, which was four feet long and over 20 pounds. That was incredible. But what we didn't expect was to also see a caribou on the opposite shore. We all heard about caribou in the park, and boy, was it a treat to actually witness one. Why are we here? We battled strong headwinds to get out of White Clay Lake, but despite turning south and entering the Goki River, we were met with even more headwind. Needless to say, Paddling wasn't an easy affair that day. Dave looks like he's already toast. We continued the tough paddle down the Goki River and ended the day at the Goki Falls, where there was a nice campsite at the beginning of the portage. Once we got settled and had supper, we had a special treat that night. So we have uh, Anita here. Today we're gonna have a little bit of a treat tonight. Um, and so today Anita's gonna make for us uh, cinnamon raisin bannock. bannock rolls. Really technically you 
you were supposed to be making it. Not me, but okay. Anyway, that's besides the point. So of course we need water. Okay. Um, the bannock mix that we made at home. Then we brought some raisins with brown sugar. We brought some extra brown sugar and some extra flour just in case we screw up. Okay. And we're gonna use reflector oven. So we got the pot, the pan for that, some napkins, and the pot for mixing. Okay. I'm gonna pour it in here. I really think I might need more water, so you might have to still need water. So it's a, not a regular dough mix, it's a bannock mix? It is. So, but this bannock mix has, um, I'm trying to remember correctly, it has egg powder in it. And some milk powder. So it's kind of your fancier type of bannock. So technically this could be bannock on its own. We can thank Composite Creation for their uh, canoe. Yes, but we have to let them know that no canoe was harmed in this video of making Bannock. We can't say that much for the actual trip itself <laughs> because it was pristine and red. So very sorry, but it's a very good canoe. Just very sorry. It's all Damon's fault. All right, so she's put some flour on the bottom of the canoe, the beautiful composite creation canoe that we did quite the number to. Thank you Andy Phillips. Very sorry, it's not my fault, it's his fault. <laughs> mm, that looks good already. Okay, sounds good. One of the keys to using a reflector oven is to have ample wood and a lively flame to capture the radiant heat from the fire and redirect it into the oven. While we were baking, our friends tried to catch us some walleyes for supper that night, but unfortunately were skunked. At least we got to enjoy the Bannock Cinnamon Raisin Buns that evening as we closed out day 9.
Day 10 started with a portage as we continued up the Goki River. Soon after, we came to a large set of rapids which we had to portage around. Too bad, since we were heading against the current as it would have been a fun set to run. So we're just on Picnic Island, uh, just before Whitewater Lake. We're taking a break because the wind's been fierce. And uh, just as we're taking a break and gonna have lunch, we've got a huge front coming in. You can see over here how dark and ominous those clouds are. So we're gonna probably get an onslaught of rain. You can actually feel the temperature drop. So something big's coming. We're stuck on an island here, so actually we might pedal to the opposite shore to get some cover. We're not sure yet, but uh, stay tuned. Something's coming. See, it was clear on this side, and we thought it was going to all pass, but that is what's coming. So everybody's now got all the rain gear including Teddy and we might head over to the opposite shore. We barely got to the mainland when the heavy rains came with thunder and lightning. In desperation we literally threw a tarp over our heads and hunkered down in the forest as we waited until the storm passed. We then continued our paddle against Headwind into Whitewater Lake, our destination for the night. The weather improved, but not the wind, as we ended the day on Best Island with tired arms. Up until this point, we hadn't had a rest day, worried we wouldn't make it out in time since we were behind early in the trip. Even though we still had 80 odd kilometers still to go, which under normal circumstances we should have continued on, we decided to stay an extra day and enjoy some R&R &R before making the final push out. The weather was gorgeous for our rest day where we did the usual things like wash and clean, and most of all relax. But there was two primary reasons we decided to stay here. First, because our fascination with Wendell Beckwith's cabins, and secondly, our hope to have a walleye shore lunch. Wendell Beckwith was an eccentric inventor who believed Best Island was the center of the universe. It was here he built many elaborately crafted cabins including the snail, an odd but highly efficient cabin where he conducted many of his scientific studies. We were in awe of this place, sadly succumbing to nature, but couldn't help marvel at this man's vision and ingenuity as he lived out the rest of his life in this slice of paradise. Despite the sad state the buildings were in, we walked in admiration and respect of this place, almost sensing his presence here. Or was it the energy and mystique of actually being the center of the universe? One thing is for certain, it is indeed a special place. We heard about the great fishing in Wabakimi, so the one thing we were all looking forward to was enjoying some fish. But because we were so focused on moving, we didn't have time to fish, let alone eat them. So today, this was a priority. So while Nita and I were busy with some baking, Dave and Dee came back with an impressive haul of walleye. The feast was on. While Dave started filleting the walleyes, Anita got a herb and cheese bannock mix put together and started baking. Once the bannock was finally made, it was then onto the fish. We used fish crisp to coat the fillets and then with a generous amount of oil and the hot pan, I started frying up the meaty fillets.
To top it off, after all the fish was fried, we baked up some delicious oatmeal cookies for dessert. Judging by the pictures of the finished products, you can bet we ate well. And yes, mission accomplished. Day 12 started bright and early as we had lots of distance to cover. It would be a day of mainly lake travel, but lots of portages to begin with. Our first portage of the day, which was also the longest, took us through a burned over area. We wondered how it was started. This would probably be set by lightning, right? Could be, yeah. It may have not been the prettiest portage, but the bonus to this trail was all the blueberries and raspberries we found along the way. I didn't get any more footage that day, as we were pushing to make distance. It didn't help that we had to battle headwind all day, especially as the second half of the day didn't have any portages to give our arms a break. Nonetheless, we were still able to cover 40 kilometers. We were both tired and relieved of our accomplishment, but there was no resting on our laurels, since we needed to do similar distance the next day. Today's travel would mainly be on lakes, but we would have to head up the Caribou River first. There was a few portages along the way, but sometimes we opted to line up the rapids instead, saving us some time. Lining a canoe up strong current or a rapid takes coordination, proper canoe placement and timing. Thankfully, it all went well here. Depending on the length of the rapid and difficulty, sometimes we opted not to use the rope. Despite my suggestion to just walk it up this short stretch, I got overruled as Anita wanted to use the rope. Here's another perspective of the same stretch we completed, but from the upstream side as Dave and Dee line up their canoe. It seems pretty easy, but it does take good balance and foot placement as you move the canoe along, as well as making sure to keep it from broadsiding to the current. I really like this stretch of the Caribou River, even with all the lining and walking. 
although I would probably have enjoyed it just as much going downstream and running some of the rapids too. At one large set of rapids, we had to portage a short ways, but along the way we witnessed this large garter snake sunning itself on the rocks. After this point, I didn't take any more footage as we concentrated our efforts on paddling against headwind towards Caribou Lake. We were really concerned about what the big lake would be like, but luckily it had settled down by the time we had gotten there as a new front had moved in and clouded over. We were now back in familiar territory as we made our way down Little Caribou and found camp midway down the narrow lake. It was another long day and we were all dog tired, but we made it. We could now rest assured the last day would be an easy paddle out. We slept in and awoke the last day to clouds and rain. It certainly wasn't the nicest send off to the end of the trip, but it was a reminder that in the land of jack pine and black spruce, nothing is predictable and everything is still wild as ever. We left the small town of Armstrong that day on our way back to civilization, already missing the wilds of Wabakimi, but grateful for an incredible experience we likely will never forget.